Greetings, programs. This is Wretch. Welcome back to Citizen Sleeper. And check it out. The Sidereal Horizon is getting ready to launch, guys. It's here on the dock. I thought it was like a giant building originally, but no, it's just a huge looking ship. And um, not only is it getting ready to launch, but we are also one cycle away from the Sidereal Draw. Now, there's no guarantee that Mina, Lem, or ourselves are going to be on this draw, but hopefully we'll, maybe we'll have some actions that'll allow us to uh, stack the deck in our favor. All right, so we have got a lot of good dice today, and actually not a whole lot of actions because we're still waiting on things, so we can probably knock a lot out today. Let's go ahead and head to Yannick's Ward, and a little bit of that trust. There we go. Now we may go ahead and finish this up. I want to see what else we have available. Um, I think we are waiting on Bliss to get another contract. Yep. So there's nothing else going on here. Let's head over to the Greenway. And the farm stacks, mushroom groves. Let's go ahead and clear out the aviary. Layers and layers of rotten mulch come away with the corroded metal, and among it, pale and delicate, you find a bird skull. Interesting. Okay, that's complete. Germinate spores. The old growth of the aviary has created a rich medium into which you can place the spores from the groves. They'll grow well here. Oh, that's cool. Insert one grove spore, so we need three. Huh. Interesting. And we need spores here for Miko. Nothing there in the dorm. I think the commune's now just for energy if we need it. Alright, looks like we can get a lot accomplished today. So let's go ahead and... I'm kind of tempted just to... collect a lot of spores right now. Eh, neutral outcome. That's a shame. Well, that'll finish the one for Miko, so let's do that. Or Rico. Was it Miko or Rico? Guess we're about to find out. Rico. There. Yeah. Rico is grateful for the contribution. Good. Open. Here we go. Ah, sleeper. Rico greets you without so much as looking up from her work. I have some of yours here. Come see. She beckons you over to a heavyweight looking console, wired to a series of specimen jars, some of which contain your spores. What does it say? Well, the spores you have here are a real cocktail, a selection of types from within the groves, but I've been able to isolate a few. She taps one of the specimen jars. Here we have Tricholoma Matsutake. Rico breezes through the Latin and Japanese pronunciations as if it was nothing, unlike what I just did. <laughs> a species Solheim somewhat modified for use on the station. She brings up a panel on her console showing a chemical composition, all gradiented bars and obtuse acronyms. This is the composition of the Solheim modified Matsutake spores. Modified? Yes. Every species on the eye is a tweaked variant of Solheim's, of course, but that's not the point. Rico brings up another panel, identical in layout, but with wildly different colors and numbers. You see, this is what your Matsutake spores look like. 
they aren't the same? <laughs> That's the conclusion, yes. Rico glances at the specimen jar as if it might have something to add. They are fundamentally the same species, but they carry different chemicals, different signals. She leans back and sighs. Sohai may have introduced their own tweaked versions in the beginning, but the grows have and still are affecting them. Affecting them how? Well, it's hard to tell without samples of fully grown mushrooms. She meets your eye. And herein lies our problem. She moves to another desk where two trays sit side by side. The first contains nothing but plant mulch. The second you smell before you even look at it. The pungent aroma of the fruiting matsutake, like rotting, sodden overalls, laced with an edge of spice. Yeah, the matsutake here are grown from Solheim stocks, pulled from a spore vault in this complex. She winks. They are delicious, by the way. She sets them aside. The empty tray is germinated with the spores you collected. No activity. No germination. Nothing. Yeah, we're not going to tell her she made a mistake. But the groves are full. Yes, they are. Rico looks at you directly. And you suddenly realize how much she's enjoying this. So here's our puzzle, sleeper. Spores from the groves won't grow in the lab. But gathering fruiting bodies from the groves is too unpredictable. We need to grow a fruiting body from some of these spores so we can track it, understand it. In short, I need you to become my mushroom farmer. Um, actually, I already started. Rico looks impressed. Well, well, an eager mycologist. I'd never have guessed. I assume you set yourself up in the aviary? I've been eyeing that place up for its proximity to the groves. Bring me whatever grows, and not just Matsutake. There's more than a couple of variants in there, so I'll need plenty of samples. She plucks a Matsutake cap from the tray. These little things are reflections of their conditions. Their smell, their taste, their chemistry. It all derives from the conditions of their growth. She smells the cap. Enough of these and we'll have a picture of what is happening here. Of the ways in which this biosphere is modifying itself. Or being modified. Whichever the case may be. Rico pops the Matsutake cap into her mouth, taking you by surprise. And don't worry, sleeper. She says while softly chewing. If this turns out to be a dead end, I'll make sure that not a single mushroom will go to waste. Here you go. Okay, so now, oh, girl samples and Matsutake samples, so it doesn't really matter what we bring. I'm so curious about that gardener. Alrighty, um, well, if that is the case, I think we can go ahead and just start throwing these final two dice into mushroom farming unless we want to go ahead and finish up Yannick's ward hmm well let's go ahead and let's go ahead and farm some mushrooms first we'll see what our reroll is if our reroll is high, we'll go ahead and finish off Yannick's Trust, or at least attempt to. So we got the groves there if we want to forage, but the aviary is right here. We will collect some spores. Lovely. Reroll. Ooh. All right. That worked out well. You extract the spores from the sample print and mix with water, then inject them into the prepared mulch. It's precise work. So 
So this is where we get the uh, Matsutake caps that um, Emphis needs. All right. We'll cross to the rim. And see where this is going to take us. You almost laugh when you see it. The same small recorder. Stuck to a different wall this time. Written across the fluorescent tape is that familiar word. Sleeper. You grab it quickly. Rabia says sorry. Sabine's voice sparks up once again. She said she didn't have time to brief you before setting you up with the old man. I'm sure you've got the play by now. On his trust, work the block, then we need you to get into his office. A pause. It's risky, but obviously you're the only one of us who he doesn't already know. Either way, we need to locate the link to SNOP. You hear a shout in the background of the recording. Rabia says, be careful. Sabine continues. The data suggests there's some relay, processing the implant data and sending it to SNOP, but we can't lock down its position. Either he's moving it, or it's moving itself, or it's rerouting through other relays. We, we can't understand it. Maybe you can find some details on it in his office. Once he trusts you, you should be able to get close enough to get in the office. You'll only get one shot. The recording creaks and whines. That's the final piece of the puzzle to end this. A pause. Good luck, Sleeper. I'm sorry to... Be safe. The recording clicks off, leaving you in silence. You pocket the recorder, just in case, and walk away. Looks like it's up to you. Yannick's office. Find the relay. All right. Well, we're not we're not doing that today. We are out of dice. So we shall go ahead and feed the kitty. And we just got a little bit of hunger. Nothing too bad. We'll call it a day. Alrighty. Give the tribute. And what we got down here? Oh lord. Oh, Tala's ready. Lemon Mina are ready. So much room for activities. Okay. Um. Let's talk to Tala first. Tala comes to you one shift when the bar is empty, tapping you on the shoulder as you clean the bar. It's ready. She's grinning from ear to ear. Can I try? <laughs> Obviously. She grabs you by the arm before you can ask anything else and drags you into the back room. The smell hits you immediately when you enter. A cocktail of rich fermentation and chemical sharpness. The room is warm and bright now, the newly installed lights making the place look clean, whether it is or not. Tala has already pulled up a couple of stools around a metal crate, where two glasses with a few fingers of pale garole sit inside sit waiting. She smiles. I haven't even tried it yet. You can see she's nervous. You both sit at the makeshift table the slight strangeness of the situation, making you both jumpy. Tala hands you a glass. Cheers, she says solemnly, and knocks the glass back. You do the same. The first sensation is burning, a sharp, nose-clearing blast of alcohol that has your frame querying whether you should like to activate safe mode. You gulp the drink back, and it's only then, behind the burn, that you taste the earthy tones of the mushrooms, the wood and the soil, left behind like sediment, barely there. Whew, that's strong. Tala nods vigorously. 
Oof. That was heavy. Has promise, though. You think? She swirls the glass and puts it down. Wait. I have an idea. Tala grabs a metal bottle from the newly installed work surface and adds a few drops of water into the girl. Try again? This time, the burn is a warming glow. Harsh, but fading off, and the woodiness less heavy. You taste something floral in among the marshy decay, something fresh and bright that you never expected to find. Both you and Tala meet eyes. It's really good, right? It is. Tala grins with her whole face, and that makes you smile too. Tala pours out some more garol, and then adds some more water. The action's already taking on the quality of a ritual. You both drink. Tala tucks her feet beneath her on the stool, folding her legs. She looks down into her glass and swirls the liquid thoughtfully. What's on your mind? Tala looks up at nothing in particular. My father opened this place, you know. She says out of nowhere, a thought suddenly becoming words. It was his attempt at making a life for us, for my family, when we got to the eye. Your family? Yeah, my father, my mother, my little brother. She takes a drink. They aren't around now. I'm um, sorry. That's okay. My parents had long lives, and my brother's somewhere in the Starward Belt. Ran off with the salvage crew. She puts her glass down. He's alive, as far as I know. I was just thinking about something my father told me. When he first set this place up, he wanted to call it the Bantian, but he was afraid it'd scare off the customers, so he kind of translated it. Hence, the Overlook. And these past few cycles, when I've been in here... I've been thinking that I should rename the place. She looks at you. The Bantian. What do you think? Or Bantayan? What does it mean? Dad say, said he translated it to Overlook, so something like that. Watchtower, maybe? Lookout? Tala picks up her glass. That settles it then. To the Bantian. You both clink your glasses and drink up. Tala hisses through her teeth. Ugh, still harsh. She laughs, then suddenly grabs your shoulder. Oh, sleeper. I totally forgot. She stumbles to her feet. Yeah, you guys have been drinking a bit. She lurches over to a corner of the room, covered with a plastic sheet, and whips it off like a magician performing a trick. Beneath it is a neat little kitchen. A sink, a work surface, and a compact oven with a hob. Your kitchen. She doesn't give you time to respond. You can come make stuff here anytime, as long as you promise not to raid the mushroom farm. I need those for the girl. I was thinking too that if things pick up, we can start serving proper food at the Overlook. <laughs> I mean, the Bantian. Do you like it? It's perfect. Tala gives you a hug, then quickly stands back. I'm sorry, I just... I'm so glad you're here. She grins. Me too. As Tala tidies away the glasses, you inspect the kitchen, checking that it all works. It's small and salvaged, but after what you've had to put up with, it feels like a dream come true. Later, when she's done for the day, Tala comes back through, through to the bar, and you share a glass of good garol, the one she didn't distill. And this time you talk about nothing in particular, sharing stories about regulars or discussing the best place to eat on the eye, which after everything that's happened, feels like a nice change of pace. When it comes time to leave, you promise to cook for Tala and agree to let her know which shifts she'll be working in the coming cycles. 
then slip out into the cool of the rotunda. And in this moment you feel, for once, at home. Free spirit achievement unlocked. And we got that upgrade point. Which means we can go ahead and use self-repair. Use scrap components at home to repair condition. So should we go ahead and test that out real quick? Perk self-repair. With some careful engineering, you can patch up your damaged body with scrap components. The result isn't pretty. Well, neither are we, really. Alright, let's see. Hey, that ain't bad. That ain't bad at all. Alright. Um, back here. And it's not, it's not the Overlook anymore. It's the Bantian. Cook caps, cook Matsutake caps. Oh. And then the bar shift. Neat. Okay, we got the merchant freighters here. And... Action unavailable. You had your chance to haggle the prices, the merchants won't... Oh, okay. Well, that's unfortunate. But that is what it is. Now... Let's talk to Lemon Mina and see what's going on over here. The crowds have already gathered by the time you get to the shipyard, and you recognize faces among them. People you've worked alongside at the Sidereal. The intervening cycles have turned their excitement to anxiety, and a few of them smile at you. Instead, and few of them smile at you. Instead, the nervous energy of the crowd fills the space, creating a feedback feedback loop of growing tension. You pick out Lem and Mina and work your way over to them, pushing through the crowd. He silently raises his eyebrows at you, his anxiety obvious, but Mina flashes you a huge smile, unaware of the tension. Robot! She shouts, reaching to you. Hug her. Why not? She gratefully accepts your hug, leaning against your chest and Lem smiles, seemingly glad to share the weight of Mina for a moment. Quite the turnout, huh? Lem glances around, pulling Mina close. I don't think patience is one of this crowd's strengths. The sound of an argument towards the back catches your and Lem's attention. He's putting it lightly. This place seems set to explode. This isn't good. Lem doesn't dare answer, but the look in his eyes suggests he agrees. <sharp inhale> this is Aster Enghardt of the Celis Foundation. The announcement echoes from the speakers at the shipyard entrance, and shouts of QUIET rapidly follow. I'm sorry I can't be there to meet you all, and thank you, on behalf of Sendre Celis, for the work you have done on the Sidereal Horizon. Most of the crowd strains to see Ashter's face, but the small display shows only a ghostly white figure, smudged and unclear. Sendre wanted me to pass on her personal thanks for your commitment and belief in the Celis Foundation's mission. We chose the Eye for this project because we knew that we would find like-minded individuals here, especially among the ranks of the Venerable Haven Age Association. Unlike most of the core, we neither believe Erlen's eye to be a threat or a rogue state, but instead an embryo for the formation of a new, decentralized social structure, one where each citizen might be the master of their own destiny. A ripple of impatience runs through the crowd. They didn't come here for a sermon. You are all pioneers, just like those core citizens who the Sidereal Horizon will carry, in cryosleep, to the planet that will become the found Foundation's first frontier word, world, Celis One. At the mention of the destination world, excited conversations break out amongst the workers. There, our citizens will be able to create their own innovative, bottom-up economic order, aligned with the principles set down by Sendre Celis herself. Freedom, resilience, and self-sustenance. This is all thanks to your tireless efforts in the Haven Age Yards. 
As a reward for those efforts, you may know that we are offering a select group the opportunity to join the caretakers of this vision. The staff of the Sidereal Horizon who will maintain the vessel during its multi-decade transit through interstellar space. Lemps turns to you, his eyes bright. This is it. This drawl has been performed at random by the central AIs of the Foundation, and is final and binding. Please note, only licensed contractors of the Foundation are eligible for this draw. I know you've all been eagerly awaiting this day, and without further delay, I will now read the Celis identification numbers of those chosen for this great honor. I already see a problem here, because only licensed contractors are eligible for the draw. That means Mina can't come. A murmur runs through the crowd. Celis identification numbers? Licensed contractors? You've never even heard the term mentioned. Is this something you were supposed to be assigned? You glance at Lem, but his eyes are fixed forward, wide and shimmering. All around you people are speaking in hushed tones, like a rising wave. Aster starts reading out sequences of numbers and letters, and panic starts to set in. No one seems to know what's happening. Somewhere near the front of the crowd, someone shouts in celebration, and everyone pushes forward. We're about to have a Who concert situation here. Lem? You turn to see Lem still staring forward. Mina is scared now, as the shouts start. Daddy? Someone throws something at the entrance, and it rattles against the shipyard doors. You see, for the first time, Haven Age security stood on either side, scared, arguing between themselves. You feel the anger rising in the crowd. Lem, let's go. He doesn't move. I'm just... They might call out names. I can't... Mina tugs at his dog tags. It's not happening. Lem blink blinks rapidly, and then turns to you. He opens and closes his mouth and looks down at Mina. He sees the fear in her eyes and understands. It's time to go. You lead Lem and Mina out, shoving people aside. As you do, you hear the sound of scuffles emerging at the front of the crowd, of metal canisters bouncing off the shipyard walls. You keep your head down and walk away. The sound of Aster reading off the ciphers echoing above this chaos like some strange mantra. When you turn to Lem, there are tear tracks running down his cheeks, and Mina sniffing into his jacket. You feel the sadness rising in you, too. They screwed you. Screwed all of you. You were never even on the list. The feeling is as unpleasant as it is familiar. You stare ahead into the tunnel as the security sirens sound out, a signal for the coming violence. Wow. Drive failed. What? Well, that sucks. I didn't know that... Hmm. Alright. Well, that's unfortunate. But maybe... Maybe there's still a chance? Anything else pop up? Wait. Oh, there's something going on here at Lem and Mina's unit. Lem's out. There's a not on, nor, note on the door of the unit. Sleeper, gone to find work. Lem. Interesting. Alright, guys. Well, on that very bitter note... Um, we are going to go ahead and call it a day. Um, we still have some good dice here. We'll go get some uh, mushrooms. We'll see what's going on in Yannick's office. Still got a lot to do. If you guys like the episode, please leave a like down below. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. That'd be a big help. And we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.